Hey, good morning. Welcome to North Raleigh Christian Church. How's everybody doing today? Hey, great to be able to come together and to worship. Hey, we invite you into a time of worship as we prepare our hearts and minds for God's word this morning. Come on, let's stand up together. Let's lift our voices in praise. Come on. Friendsgiving, right? We got some good food out there after service. We've got turkey, we've got stuffing, we've got delicious. Uh, you see, I go for like the cupcakes and all that kind of stuff afterwards. So after after uh, church today, make sure you hop over there. If this is your first time, hey, thanks for coming. 
Um, we have a connect card in the seat back in front of you. Make sure you fill that out. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better. Our mission here is to help you find your purpose through following Jesus. And today as we worship and today as you hear the word from Justin, we really hope that you can take those next steps in following Jesus. One of those things that you can do is that you can try five. We, we really want you to become a part of our family, our church family. But we don't think you can do it one time. You come and visit us, you're like, hey, this is a great church service. That's great. But who are these people? Try us five times. Check us out a few times. See if this is a good fit. And if it's not, we want to find the place for you that is. We are connected with great churches and church families from all over the place. Our, our, our friend here who is uh, worshiping with us today is planning a church here in Durham. We have, we have connections with all sorts of great church communities, and we want to make sure we uh, help you do that. Um, quick announcement, next Sunday is our family Sunday. We are not going to be doing elementary service for the kids. The kids will be in here worshiping and listening to the, the service with us uh, next Sunday. So just be prepared for that, parents. We will have um, the uh, nursery and we will have the toddlers, uh, uh, the preschoolers rather. Um, so they, they will still have their, um, their service in there. And then uh, lastly, you know, I, I wanted to bring something up too. We're a church that really cares about our community and, and especially when our community hurts. I don't know if you guys heard yesterday about what happened at the Raleigh um, Christmas Parade. And then just a couple weeks ago, there was, there was the tragedy at Headingham. And, you know, for me, I, I like to not think that, you know, I'm a man, I'm not very emotional, but I heard about that and I was folding laundry yesterday and it got to me because I have a little girl about that age and it, it really broke my heart and it breaks God's heart. And I want to be a church community. And I know that we are a church community that loves his people and, and grieves with his, with his people. And so, you know, as we enter into a season of Thanksgiving and as we enter into a season where we're going to be around family and that might be hard for some folks, I want to make sure that you know that you have a church community here that loves you and wants to be with you. We have uh, men and women who have uh, Thanksgiving celebrations where if you're alone and you need to be with somebody, they have a place where you can go and just have a great time with a bunch of great people and come talk to me if you're looking for something like that. But I also want to make sure that we're being a community that's praying for people that are hurting during those seasons. So I'm going to pray for us now as we enter into um, uh, the rest of our worship today. Um, Father, thank you for today. Thank you for um, loving us. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to be able to come before you, Lord, to um, be able to worship you, Lord. I know that you're a God of peace and you're a God of, of reconciliation. And more importantly, you're a God of hope, a hope of the, rec uh, the resurrection, a hope of, of the promise of the cross. And today as we worship and we lean into you and we, we, we come in your presence, God, I ask that we can live that out in our lives, that we can come closer to you and we can ask for that resurrection in our own hearts. Be with the families and the people that are grieving and that are hurting, Lord. Give them peace. Help us to be a community that, that loves and supports and comes alongside and is like Jesus to those people like that in our community. Be with us today as we worship and we keep that in our hearts, Lord, that you are the hope of salvation. In Jesus' name. Sins of the world, his blood breaks the chain. 
God, who is not only the lion, the lion of Judah, but he is the lamb, the one who went and laid himself down on our behalf, taking upon our sin and our shame. For the purpose that we have a God who loves his creation and wants nothing more than to be with his creation. It's love. I don't, I don't know where you are this morning. Like, maybe, like, the past few weeks have just been tough. Like, all of a sudden, like, kids went back to school, and they brought home just all of this love. <laughs> and everybody feels terrible right now. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're in a place where it's just, like, this time of season, this time of year can just be tough. You know, we have friends that we miss and family that we miss. And this time of year can be tough. So we face battles. We face all kinds of things that are just coming up against us. But our hope is this, is that the battles and the things of this world are temporary. And not only that, but we have a God who loves us and is on our side. Even in the spiritual battles and the things that come up against us, God is fighting for us. Sometimes we like to fight those battles and we'll take them upon ourselves. But really, truly, God is fighting those battles right alongside you. Can be a 
against me For Jesus there's nothing impossible Stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. also be a sign of surrender of ourselves and allowing you to take control. Lord, thank you for being able to be here this morning, for the opportunity to come together into fellowship, to sing praises, to be renewed, to be re-energized, to hear your word today. Lord, I pray that your word is preached powerfully today. Lord, that we hear your word and not only hear it, but Lord, allow that to penetrate into our hearts to our lives, Lord, and change us into the people that you would have us to be. Lord, we love you. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated.
Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Hey, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors on staff and just so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. We are in the middle of a series called Thanks, Dad, where we're simply looking at four psalms this month, month of thankfulness. And so this week, we're going to be in Psalm 92. So if you have your Bibles or your apps, you want to open that up and, and join me on that. If you're here today and you don't own a Bible, hey, no worries. If you go out those doors and turn left and go to the welcome desk, we have Bibles as our free gift from us to you. We would love for you to have that in your house. And so if you remember, the first week we talked about uh, the Psalms, or we talked about thanks, Dad, we ended with uh, a, an idea of thanking God for the fleas. Remember that if you were here? If you missed that, you can go back and watch online. Essentially, a story of a Christian in a Nazi concentration camp that the barracks were swarmed with fleas, and she was leading Bible studies and leading women to Jesus in those barracks, and they were trying to be thankful for everything, and even the fleas that were just everywhere, and they found out that the fleas were the reason that the guards would not come into the barracks to stop the study of God's word and the leading people to Jesus. And so we learned that even there might be things in our lives that are, that are bad, that are rotten, that are hard, we can still be thankful for those things because God is still working. And last week we talked about standing before the gods as David, he wrote in the, one of these Psalms, King David, standing before the gods and praising the true God. And for us, we stand before the gods of our culture, the gods of our wants, the gods of our pride, and we still worship God no matter what. Remember, we talked about what keeps us from developing a posture of thankfulness or the things that we want and the things that we have done. And we don't have to worry about those things anymore. Now, I, I want to start with something kind of, kind of serious because I realize that in this room today, we have some sickos. In this room, there's people who can't control themselves right now, and you know who you are. You're the people who started decorating for Christmas before Thanksgiving. You know what's going on. You know that these poor turkeys and pilgrims are all tired of being ignored. They need their time too, and, and they're just getting passed over, over and over. Meanwhile, Rudolph is over there with his stupid red nose, and he's all excited because he gets more time, you know, and, and, I, and I get that, but I'm going to play along this year. The main reason, because I secretly love it too, <laughs> you know, but I got to put on this mask and persona and be above it all, but I absolutely love Christmas. So this is going to be a secret just between us and all the people who watch on YouTube. Uh, this will just be our little secret but there are certain things about the Christmas season, as we're getting ready to step into that, that just stir nostalgia. You know, you think of, of family members, you think of when you're a kid, you think of, of things in the past and things that you really loved and the, the things that you, that you miss. And for someone like me, whose childhood was in the 80s and whose youth was in the 90s, we spent a lot of time watching television. And so what triggers Christmas nostalgia for me in a lot of ways is, is commercials, you know, and there's certain commercials, and I think even kids today will get it because it's on TV, that stir, uh, stir uh, nostalgia like these. I got the first example. See if you remember what this one is. Those polar bears. Nothing says Merry Christmas like vicious animals that will eat your face drinking a Coke, right? So Merry Christmas. The polar bears come out. You know it's getting to be time. And then there's this next one. I love this one. This is my favorite. The Hershey Kisses, that ring, we wish you Merry Christmas. And that last little bell gets so excited. It's like, ding, you know, it's like, great. It's just like, makes you feel all warm. So y'all, y'all with me on these two? Yeah. All right, what about this next one? All the Clydesdale horses. Nothing says Christmas like cheap American soulless beer, you know, right? <laughs> Merry Christmas from Budweiser. Here's terrible beverage, right? But one that always stuck out to me because of just the, the picture is, is this next one. Cheap Mexican beer, right? It's Corona. And the reason why is because I am a person who despises all things cold. I hate winter. And so when I see that commercial and I'm like, man, I want to be under the palm trees. I don't care about what they're at. I love this commercial. And when the palm tree lights up, it's just great. But also, these palm trees always reminded me of something that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about uh, Psalm 92, and the palm tree plays a pretty significant role in telling of this story. You know, and I, I love how these commercials make us all feel like, like okay, I, I remember things. But for the Jewish people, the palm trees actually meant something amazing, and specifically the date palm. 
Uh, I've seen that, that, that or it, it, was, it was seen as one of the greatest uh, gifts of God was the date palm. It was seen as something that was so important and part of this creation. Its image was carved all over. It was in doors and do- doorposts. The date palm was even carved into the walls of the temple. It was one of the most valuable symbols and the most visible symbols of the Garden of Eden. It symbolized, you know, God's provision. It was one of the most visible signals or signs pointed back to what God is doing in the people of Israel's lives and how he has provided for them. And it was something that was absolutely amazing. It even took them all the way back to the Garden of Eden and to life here on earth. And even when, when John was talking of revelation, when he was, was either taken up or, or, or not, or, 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 or he was given a vision of what heaven's going to he talked about the palm tree being next to the crystal clear waters of heaven. Archaeologists also tell us that the palm tree uh, had a lot of meaning in other cultures as well. To the Egyptians, to the Babylonians, to the Greeks, to the Romans, it was mystical and it was, it was special. Ancient Egyptian coffins have been discovered and has palm trees carved into them to provide for them and what they believed was the, was the afterlife and what was going to happen. Of course, on Palm Sunday, it plays a prominent role with Jesus and how palm trees were, palm branches were waved and, and laid on the, on the ground before him. And into the usefulness aspect of it, a date palm will produce over 300 pounds of dates per year. It provided shelter. It provided uh, status. It provided provided money and income. The African oil palms are the highest yielding oil producing plant in the world. Palm trees were valuable. And we're going to come back to this palm tree stuff a little bit later, okay? You know, or as we say in the business world, we're going to circle back to that. Anyone hate that conversation? We're going to circle back to that. Well, we're going to circle back to it in just a few minutes because the palm trees, and specifically in Psalm 92, it's powerful. And so the author and the occasion of Psalm 92, we don't know. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know what was going on or as far as the context or exactly when it was written. But the central thought of, the, of Psalm 92 is simply this. No matter what, God is on his throne. And I think that's important for us to, to think about and to, to teach through and to, to implement into our lives. That no matter what this world comes up with, no matter what happens in our life, God is still on his throne. And maybe someone needs to hear that today. I know I, I certainly do. And there are days when it's like, man, if we're honest, we're not so sure if God's still on this throne. Or is that just me? Anybody in here with me? All right, come on, talk to me. Yep. All right. Verse 1 of Psalm 92, it starts with this. It simply says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. It's good because giving thanks is appropriate. It, it's, it's good because thanks. Thanks to our Redeemer is, is refreshing and it is, it is fitting. It is good because giving thanks to the one who blesses us and delivers us is, is right. It is good because giving thanks to, the, to, to God does us great benefit as it helps us grow closer to him and it helps us to find peace of, of his provision. It is good because we grow from our outpouring as we continually give thanks to God. You see, part of giving thanks to God is also you know, praying and, and, and having conversations, but it's also included with singing. Like today, we, we purposely picked joy-filled songs today. I mean, did you enjoy the joy-filled songs? Enjoyed the joy-filled songs? A lot of joy happening. I enjoyed the joy-filled songs, and I have joy that you had joy. No, right? You see, when we sing, church, God isn't concerned about us being on key. Now, now up here, the leaders have to be on key. I get that. But for all y'all, it doesn't matter. Look, there's a reason I don't have a microphone, right? Because one, I love to sing. Two, meh. Right? You know? It's okay. And so when we're encouraged to sing out as part of of our our worship, part of sending praise to God for what he's done. You see, when we started this church, I knew that there was something that, that, that we just couldn't do. I just couldn't go back to that. I grew up in a church tribe culture, a church culture, so to speak, of pretty joyless music. I mean, it was like, you know, and it was like, oh, ugh right? And so I knew we couldn't do that. And so one of the principles of our worship culture is joy. 
that we want to bring joy because the joy of the Lord is our strength, and we're going to sing about it. And we're not going to sing a lot of songs about me and I, although there are times when that's appropriate, but we're not going to spend a lot of time singing about that. And so I'm more encouraged by someone named Miss Thelma. We don't have any Thelmas in our church, by the way, who sings and she sounds like a screech owl. That should be more encouraging than someone who sings perfect pitch and with a great voice because that's someone who is singing to the Lord with everything that they have because of their thankfulness. And so in my culture that I grew up in, where church time of praise was pretty unmoving, I knew we couldn't go back to that. Because when we sing, God isn't concerned about us being on key. And when we stop to think who it is that we are worshiping, all the things that he has done, all the good that he has done for us, how can we not sing? And look at the reasons why we sing. Look at verse 2. It says, to declare, look, your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. We sing of God's love. And look, morning here doesn't just mean that time of day when the sun's coming up. You know that, right? Night here doesn't mean that time of day when the moon's out and the, sun, the sun's down and it's dark. Yeah, we should sing praises 24 hours a day, but that's not really the big picture here. We sing of God's steadfast love when life is great, but we also sing of his faithfulness when we're in the darkest times of our life and it's just the world is assaulting our souls. And we sing of God's faithfulness to help us get through that. It's so much deeper than this. It is vital for Christ's followers to sing through the sadness to remind ourselves of God's faithfulness. And so if you're in here and you're in a season of sadness, sing, sing, sing. There are times when life's a mess and we don't understand the reason why. We don't know why things have happened. We, we just, and maybe some of us in this room, you're in that moment right now. Maybe some of us watching online, you're in that moment right now, and you're just not so sure what's going to come and what's next. You didn't want to go through a divorce. You didn't want to get sick. You didn't want for them to die. You didn't ask for mental struggles. You didn't mean to make a mistake. But here we find ourselves again and again in this time of darkness and difficulty, and we're just sitting in it. You see, we sing in the mornings of life because we believe it, and we sing to God in the darkness of life because we want to. And even when we doubt, and even when we're scared, and even when we're not sure we feel this or not, God is still good. So we sing. We sing to build our faith. Verse 3, the author goes on and, you know, declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night to the music of the lute and the harp and the melody and the lyre. You see, worship in the Old Testament, there was a word to describe it. You know what that word is? Loud. It was loud. They had all the instruments. They had all the choir. There were certain ceremonies in the Old Testament in the temple where during the, the, the key moment when everything came together and it was the, the, the biggest part and, and it just got the loudest, there were these giant symbols. And each symbol took two men to carry. And one would start on one side of the, te of the temple, one would start on the other side of the temple, and they would take off just running toward each other with these giant symbols like, rah, like Braveheart, rah, you know, and they would run together. With a giant just crash of these symbols, often, and tradition says that the men who were carrying the symbols would be knocked unconscious, because I guess they would run together. And so, I want that job. That's, that's a job like a 16-year-old boy would do, like all day long, right? And so they would run together in this moment because they were just expressing the might of, of God in their worship. And so Old Testament used all kinds of instruments. We use instruments as well. Verse 4 goes on, it says, For you, O Lord, have made me glad by, look, your work. Not my work, not the church's work, not the preacher's work, your work. At the works of your hands, I sing my joy. You see, some of us struggle to feel good about ourselves at times. Look, summer's over, it's hoodie season, you know, that helps a little, right? So often we get it backwards. So often we sing songs of worship, and the subject matter seems to be us more than it seems to be God, right? And like I said, there, there, are, see, there, there are times when that's okay. You know, certainly psalms are written from that and from that, that, that standpoint. But we're singing of God's great work, not about what we do. 
Verse 2 spoke of God's faithfulness by night and his love in the morning. You see, the, the acts of God are not to be separated from his nature. The things that God does for us, that's who he is. The way he, he treats us and the way he loves us and the way he cares for us, that's simply who he is. And so we can be thankful for all of that. And we can stand strong and we can, we can live. But part of living life is simply realizing that sometimes life is hard. Often life is hard. And we know these things are coming. And when we know that these things are coming and it's going to, to be like this, we can understand that we can keep our thankfulness and we can learn to sing through any of the doubts that we may have. Our singing for joy doesn't have anything to do with us, but how great that he is. So the next few verses, the psalmist, he makes this switch where he talks about mankind for a second. And it gets a little, little, little rough. Verse 5, it says, how great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. Can I be honest and real for a second, just, just out there? Sometimes I get frustrated with God. Am I the only one? All right. I look at life. I'm like, I wouldn't make it this way. I look at the things that are going, I wouldn't have done that. I look at things, you know, people making decisions and, and, and doing things that, that are just destroying their life, even though it, it feels like it's the best thing and the most exciting, most fun thing ever. But, but you see that their futures are getting, getting wrecked. And I'm like, God, I wouldn't have made it, made it that hard. I look at this world and the things that people have adopted and they're pursuing, and it's just like, ah, I wouldn't have done it that way, God. I struggle with the things that I struggle with, and it just becomes exhausting because it just never stops. I don't always understand why there's so much pain or why I had to experience all the, the nonsense I've had to experience or why I've even had to move so much. And maybe you can reflect on some of your experience too. Maybe you look at the result of your life and the experiences of your life and the, the, the past that, that you've gone through and you're just like me and we're all in this together. It's like, I wouldn't have done it that way. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 says this, for my thoughts, this is coming from the the aspect of, of God. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your ways, than, than your thoughts. Paul in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he wrote this in 1 Corinthians 1 25. It says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than, than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than than men. And we read these verses and we're reminded again and again, we're not God. We don't get to make the call. We're not God and his wisdom is so much more than anything that we can comprehend. And it's so easy. Look, I'm, we're not piling on anybody here today. It's so easy because we just see what's right in front of us. And it's like, man, God, if I could just pay my rent or, or if I could just, you know, have a relationship with them or if I could just do something, then life would be better. And we feel this over and over and God's saying, but you don't see the big picture like I do. And so when we realize that God is in control, that God knows, and that God is in charge, and that God's ways are so much higher than ours, we can start to understand. You see, wisdom, church, wisdom isn't having all the answers. Wisdom is believing and trusting that God does. And so when we don't understand why things are the way we, they are or why we are the way we are or why we are going through the things we're going through, wisdom is trusting that God knows what's going on and that he has us. Verse, verses 6 through 9, it goes on and says this. It says, the stupid man, whoa, hey, calm down with those words. You can't, it's not very positive. You know, you can't say stupid. My kids aren't allowed to say stupid at home. Well, that's stupid. The stupid man cannot know, the fool cannot understand this. And though the wicked sprout like grass and all the evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. 
For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish and all evildoers shall be scattered. You know, at times, we can be really stupid. Am I up here alone? Anybody with me? Amen. Amen. All right. At times, we can, we can make... I was writing this message, and I was like, okay, what's the dumbest thing I've ever done? And I was like, gosh, there's so many to choose from, right? You know, I was like, okay, what do I do? I, you know, okay, I was like 13, and we went to my neighbor's house, and, and we, we stole like 112 gauge shotgun shells, and we cut them open, and we got the powder out, and we tried to make a, a homemade hand grenade out of all of that. Terrible idea, kind of worked, was kind of cool. Can't lie, you know, I mean, so, so you have, have that... You know, I was saying, okay, I've, I've done that. I was, that was pretty dumb. Or, or when I was 15, a sophomore in high school, my algebra teacher was droning on and on about something I couldn't get. And then she started talking about the college she went to. And I raised my hand and said, there's no way you went to college because no one with a college degree is that dumb. You know, I've been smarter. Or living in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and wanted to see if I could go 150 miles an hour on a motorcycle. I got to 152, <laughs> allegedly. You know, pretty dumb, pretty dumb stuff. I've done stupid things. I've treated people poorly. I've made the wrong call. I've said words I shouldn't say. If I asked you to raise your hand, 100% of us do the same, right? So you see what's going on here. We're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat with this God who is great, with this God who is amazing, and this God who, who loves us. And so we've all done things, and some of us have done things that we hope no one ever finds out about because we're so much worse than talking back to a teacher or speeding down the interstate on a motorcycle, allegedly. What about being so ignorant that we can't see how our actions are affecting other people? What about being so ignorant that we can't see what we're doing to our parents? What about being so, so ignorant of our actions that we can't understand how it affects our kids? How about when we're disobedient to our parents and it just breaks their hearts? What about the stupidity of consuming pornography and and, and allowing that to rewire your brain for for dopamine highs and it just keeps going over and over and it's ruining future marriages or the marriage you're in now? Or the stupidity of ignoring the needs of our spouses? Or the stupidity of compromising God's plan and, and, and in our singleness? What about ignoring clear teachings of Scripture and accepting things that this world is pushing, an ideology that this world is pushing that is clearly against what the Word of God teaches us? And it's so easy. So even though there will be a point where Jesus returns, we're going to have to answer to all of this. We're going to have to answer this. And I think our biggest struggle of this time period is we value our own thoughts and our own feelings way more than we value the word of God. You know, it, it, that offends me. That makes me feel bad. I don't like the way that, that makes me, I don't, I don't know about that. Well, God's saying, look, these are my ways. And they're so much higher than your ways. If you trust me, if you trust me. You see, we have, when we finally believe and trust that God's wisdom is far greater than our wisdom, we will learn to be thankful in all of our circumstances, that no matter what is happening in this world or in our lives, we can be thankful. Verses 10 and 11, it goes on, it says, but you have exalted my horn, weird statement, I'll get there, but you have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. You have poured over me fresh, over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies and my ears have heard the doom of all my evil assailants. Now, we don't know the historical context of this psalm, but clearly it wasn't a great time or it wasn't a great season for a while for whoever wrote this, but it turned out okay. In verse 10, the author said, you exalted my horn. The horn of an ox was a symbol of strength, was a symbol of protection and a symbol of of, of power. And so when life was falling apart, God, for this, this writer, gave him strength to endure. 
He said, you poured fresh oil over me. You gave me refreshment, a fresh anointing. And from this crazy, awful season of life that I'm in, you made it work and you made it better. And verse 11 said, you destroyed my enemies and you brought doom to the evil people around me. And we think if God could just bring the downfall to my boss, it would be great. That's not really for us. But you know what it is for? It's for our real enemy, which is sin. It's for the things in our lives that we, that we struggle with. Because what God will do through the power of his Holy Spirit and through his word, he's going to destroy the strongholds and the enemies in our lives. And our strongholds and enemies are not other people. They're not. I know the girl in algebra talked about you behind your back. I know you have a coworker you just can't stand. Thanksgiving is coming up and you're going to have that political conversation those aren't your enemies. Sin, church, is your enemy. Gossip is your enemy. Now, I'm not talking about gossip of other people. Do I need to dial this in a little bit closer? I'm talking about our gossip is our enemy. Our slander is our enemy. Our lust is our enemy. Our, our, our desires, our lying, our greed, sex out of marriage, pornography, whatever it may be, those are our enemies that we need God to help us slay out of our lives because they're destroying us. Those are the things that Jesus will help end. And through his blood, if we choose to faithfully submit to him, his blood covers and there's forgiveness. You see, there is no sin in this room that cannot be forgiven by God. And there is no sin in this room that cannot be defeated with his help. And so whatever it is that you might be struggling with, let's let it go today. Because you can beat it with God's help. That's what he does. And so because of that, church, we have a whole lot of things to be thankful for. Amen? A whole lot of things. Look at verse 12 through 15. And here we come back to, to the palm tree. Don't picture the corona one, just a regular one, right? The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. To declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. You see, palm trees are a really interesting part of God's creation. Other plants can't withstand the harsh environments of the desert. Palm trees are like, this is my home. I like it here. Palm trees, other, other plants wither and die. The simoon, the hot, hot wind comes and, and withers plants. Palm trees are like, it's fine. They love it. They absolutely love the harsh parts of life. It provides food. It provides shelter. It provides comfort. A single date palm can provide for one year all the needs of a Jewish man, a Jewish woman, or a Jewish child. God gave us this tree to provide. We're to be like a palm tree. Do you see where I'm going with this? We're in a very harsh environment. Amen? We're called to flourish. We're in a very harsh environment. Amen? We're called to provide for other people. We're in a very harsh environment, and, and other things are withering and dying, and, and it seems like they're sprouting and it's going okay, but, but it's not. And we're called to flourish in this, and we do and we will because of who God is and how God made us and how Jesus grows us. We are called to flourish in a difficult world, Christians. We're called to flourish. So who's ready? I know it's hard. I know it makes us look weird. I get it. We look weird. Fine. I know we're outcasts. I know. We're called to flourish in our schools. We're called to flourish in our jobs. We're called to flourish before our unbelieving spouse, our unbelieving parents, our unbelieving kids. We're supposed to flourish everywhere because we have what provides and what sustains, and that's Jesus. And I know it's hard. Look, and I know there's a lot of pasts in this room. I know there's a lot of, lot of paths in this room that make us think that we can't do it, but we absolutely, we absolutely can. You see, a, a date palm is really unique in how it grows. It's, it's really interesting. It grows from the inside out. Do you know that? It doesn't grow like other trees. Like, Raleigh is what? The city of oaks, right? I call the city of leaves blowing up in my yard from the neighbors. 
It's all right. They blew in. They can blow right on out. Right. But, you know, have you ever seen like an oak tree when like a, a fence was up against it? And what does it do? The bark just kind of overtakes it. And that, that fence becomes part of the oak tree. Have you seen that? Like I've seen pictures of like bicycles and crazy things or clotheslines or all of those. And so the oak tree will just will, will consume that and it, and, it, and, it, and it causes a deformity and it, and it makes it difficult. You know what will happen to a, a band of metal if you put around a date palm? Because it grows from the inside out, it will pop the band. Like you can't put anything out around a date bomb. It just breaks right through that, that constraint. That's how we're called to flourish in this world. From the inside out, we change. And all of these things this word puts on us and our sin puts on us and our desire puts on us, we break through all of those. They don't stay a part of us any longer like an oak tree. We break them. We become holy. We become different. We, we, become, this, we become a people with a great purpose. And everything completely changes for us. The palm tree just does what it wants. And no matter what someone puts on it, you, you can't stop me because I'm supposed to keep growing. And that's who we're called to be. And so we look at our lives and we think, I can't get over this. I can't forgive them for what they did to me when I was a little girl, when I was a little boy. I, 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 can't, I can't let this go. I, I'll never be able to live without this sin that I'm doing. I really, you know, I can't get rid of that. It's, it's just, got, I can't get away from that. I, I just can't. When we do that, we're being like an oak tree and just absorbing the things that this world throws about. I don't know when, I, you didn't ask to be abused when you were 10 years old. I know that but it doesn't have to make you someone you don't want to be. Because we're called to flourish like the palm tree. And those bands that this world puts on us, we just break right on out of. The sin, you know, that, that, that so easily grabs us and, and, and snares us, we don't have to stay in that. Even though it doesn't feel like we can break it, we don't have to stay there because we can grow and break through that. You see, when it comes to following Jesus, sometimes we get it backwards. It, following Jesus, it's, it's like this. It's not change and then you can come to Jesus. It's come to Jesus, then you will change. Amen. Amen. So wherever we find ourselves, wherever our friends or our family find themselves, come to Jesus first, then we're going to work on the rest. And I promise you, you will flourish and grow like, like one of these date palm trees, and you will break through all of those things that are, that are holding, you, holding you down. Because Jesus forgives. We don't have to walk in that sin anymore. We're going to have a time of response, and the worship team's going to come back up. And during this next part of our worship service, I just simply want to ask you to consider a few things. If you're here today and you've never said yes to following Jesus, you've never uh, submitted to being baptized into Jesus, why not today? Why not today? We have two lamps on either side of the stage, and around those lamps, there'll be some of our prayer team, and these are awesome people. And I tell you, not only are these awesome people, they're awesome people who have lived life as well. They would love to pray with you and talk with you, and listen to you. I'm going to warn you, they might say, hey, when I was younger, this is what I did that was dumb, and this is what God did for me, because we're all in this together. So if you would like to have a conversation about what it means to follow Jesus during this next song in our communion time, just simply go to one of the lamps, and they would love to hear your story, and they would love to talk you through what you're dealing with, if you're here today and you believe in Jesus, but you've never made the decision to be uh, baptized into him as commanded in scripture, we can fill that up in about eight minutes and it's so warm. We have clothes and towels and everything you might need. Maybe this is the day that you say yes to Jesus for the first time. If you're here today and you're just struggling through life because you're just not making the best decisions right now and you're not sure how you're going to get out of that and you're not sure what to do what's next simply go to one of the lamps 
and we'd love to help you find hope for where you find yourself. Maybe it's time to confess some sin or you just need someone to pray with you because you're sick or someone you know is sick and you just need, just need some help. Go to the lamps. And we can start that healing process there. On either side of the stage, there's, there's two stations. And we take communion, take the Lord's Supper every week here at North Raleigh. And there, there's two cups. The bottom has the bread. The top has the juice. Be sure to grab both. Simply come up the middle aisles and go out the outside. But every week, uh, we're told in 1 Corinthians to uh, break bread together every, on the first day of every week, which is Sunday. And so every week, we want to start off our week by worshiping God and by remembering the sacrifice of Jesus, the bread representing the body of Jesus that hung on the cross, the juice representing the blood that was poured out as a payment for our sin. You don't have to do this, but what I like to do is when I come forward quietly between me and God, I just confess my sins of the week. God, I did this. Oh, I did that. I did this. And then when you get to the emblems, to the bread, to the juice, we take in remembrance of Jesus. We are reminded we are forgiven. And then let this be a jump off point for, the, for next week. I got this, God, because you got me. There's two boxes on those tables. If you would like to worship through giving, uh, feel free to do that as well. You can sit and pray. You can stand and sing. Go to one of the lamps. This is your time to respond to whatever it is that God is doing in you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We just ask that you help us to follow you as best we can. God, we know that we are a, um, we're a broken people, but you're a whole God and, and our brokenness plus you makes us whole. Lord, my prayer is that if there's someone in this room right now who doesn't know you, this is the day that that journey starts. God, I pray if there's someone in this room that believes in you but have never submitted to being baptized in you, this is the day when they, they, they make that their next step. Father, I pray if there's someone in here who's just hurting because of life's decisions, that they're not afraid, they go to someone and they, they find where that healing begins. Lord, thank you for making us like a palm tree in this crazy world. May we live up to it. God, you are good. We love you and we trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
darkness falls, it won't grieve it. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. See a victory. I'm gonna see a. Victory. 